very close. A very good day to all of you. So today I am going to discuss about one viscera of the abdomen that is the spleen. So in the first part today, first half of the lecture I will be discussing about the spleen and followed by that I will be discussing about the celiac artery or the celiac trunk. So, with respect to spleen, we will be actually learning about the spleen and the following aspects with a short introduction which will actually list out the various functions of the spleen. Then we will have the situation of the spleen where actually which abdominal region it is situated. Then followed by that the presenting parts that is the borders and surfaces of the spleen. Then relations of the spleen, visceral as well as the peritoneal relations. Then blood supply, nerve supply, venous drainage and then followed by that lymphatic drainage of the spleen and finally we will touch upon some clinical aspects. Now, the spleen is a hemolymphoid organ. So, it is related to the blood as well as the lymph. It is both a hemolymphoid organ and it is the largest lymphoid organ. They are actually secondary lymphoid organs in the body. Primary lymphoid organ is only two. One is your yellow bone marrow which is seen in the long bones which produces the B lymphocytes. The other one is the thymus which produces the T lymphocyte that migrates and gets incorporated mostly to the spleen, lymph nodes, then you have the tonsil and so on. So of which the spleen is the largest, not only a lymphoid, it is a hemolymphoid organ highly vascular, very rich blood supply and it stores most of the uh, repository, it acts as a repository for the cells of the circulatory system. It is elastic, friable, soft and somewhat purple in color. So mainly destruction of RBCs. So it is actually the they tell womb and tomb of RBC. Womb of RBC in fetal life because production takes place there. Hemopoiesis. In adult it is the tomb of the RBCs. That means tomb is the place where the dead persons are buried. So here the worn out RBCs are removed. Then store the RBCs and release when required especially platelets. So platelets are actually stored and naturally they are released whenever required. So production of RBCs in fetal life, <coughs> macrophages, major repository of macrophages and lymphocytes, especially the B lymphocytes. So these macrophages are mainly involved in immune responses, they are responsible for initiating cell mediated as well as humoral immunity. Antigen presenting cells are all produced by the spleen. It is present below the diaphragm. So naturally it moves with the respiration because with the diaphragm what happens it comes down, it pushes all the organs downwards. Then again when the diaphragm goes back to its normal or resting position at the expiration then the organs move up. So mainly the subdiaphragmatic organs they move during the respiration and spleen is a subdiaphragmatic organ and where actually it is present on the left side its size decreases starvation, old age or even hemorrhage bleeding of the spleen when it is injured or cut or ruptured 
and size diminishes even during severe exercise. It increases in well-fed persons. The size increases in well-fed persons. Spleen is not essential for life. It can be removed. It is advised in case certain cases of lymphoma or if the vascular supply is totally cut off. Then there is a occlusion of the splenic artery and so sometimes what happens they advise to go for splenectomy or removal of the spleen. So where actually the spleen is situated in the left the hypochondrium below the left costal margin or deep to the left costal margin costochondral cartilages. The spleen is actually situated and when the stomach is empty, the spleen sometimes what happens also comes to the epigastrium and sandwiched between the fundus of stomach and the diaphragm above. So, it is almost pushed to the left the extreme lateral wall of the abdominal cavity. Okay, So, it extends into the epigastrium. Especially when the stomach is empty, the medial end will extend into the epigastrium. So, as such, it is a content of the left hypochondrium. Lateral end extends up to the mid axillary line, medial end to the mid scapular line, posteriorly in the middle of scapula. You call it as the mid scapular line. So, from mid scapular line to mid axillary line, lateral most end of the spleen. This latter most end will extend up to the mid axillary line. Okay. Then we are looking at the shape of the spleen. So, mostly it comes or it is present in various shapes. The most common shape is the tetrahedral shape. Okay. The most common type of spleen, what you see here is the tetrahedral shape. And there, anteriorly, what happens? The colic impression. Because of this, it is tetrahedral in nature. If the colic impression is not deep, then it represents the segment of an orange. Or sometimes it might also be triangular. Okay. So mostly it is tetrahedral, or it might represent wedge shape like an orange segment, the fruit orange fruit segment. So that is about the situation. The left hypochondrium extend from the mid scapular line to the mid axillary line. Most common shape is the tetrahedral in shape. The spleen is under cover of the 9th, 10th, and the 11th rib. Three ribs deep to it, you have the diaphragm, and the deep to the diaphragm, you see the spleen. The axis, the long axis of the spleen corresponds to the 10th rib. So it is directed somewhat downwards, forwards and laterally. Okay. So, directed downwards, forwards and laterally is the axis, long axis of the spleen which is corresponding to the 10th rib. And as I told you, the spleen is under cover of the 9th, 10th and the 11th rib. So, that is the long axis of the spleen which is directed downwards, forwards and laterally. Measurements, it is very easy to remember the measurements of the spleen. It is called as Harry's dictum. Harry's dictum. Just remember the odd numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, 11 is the Harry's dictum. It is actually 1 inch in thickness, 3 inches in length, 5 inches breadth. 7 oz weight, 150 grams is actually the 7 oz weight, that is the weight of the spleen. And it is present deep to the 9th, 10th and 11th rib, so that is why 9, 10 and 11. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 and 11, that is the Harry's dictum, enumerating the measurements of the spleen. We come to the presenting parts or the external features. Again, we have to remember 2, 2, 2. It has got two ends, two surfaces. Then 
borders two borders so the two ends are the medial end which is almost backwards and posteriorly then you have the lateral end of the spleen medial end and the lateral end two ends two surfaces the visceral surface which is facing inwards and one which is facing outwards or external surface is the diaphragmatic surface visceral surface and diaphragmatic surface two surfaces then you have two angles antero basal angle and posterior angle or it is also called as postero basal angle two surfaces two ends two angles and two borders superior border and inferior border of course most of the books also describe another intermediate border which actually corresponds to the hilum of the spleen okay so two surfaces two ends two angles is actually agreed by most of the books so borders mostly you see a well demarcated border is the superior and the inferior border and an intermediate border is also described now coming to the ends it has got anterior end two ends or lateral end posterior end is the medial end the anterior end is expanded it is not just a point but you are able to see it is expanded and more like a border it is expanded and you are able to see it is more like a border directed downwards forwards and medial so that is the long axis of the spleen directed downwards forwards and medially it is related below to the left colic flexure and immediately between the left colic flexure called as the splenic flexure you have the phrenico colic ligament so that is the phrenico colic ligament which is present immediately below the anterior or lateral end of the spleen phrenico colic from the diaphragm that is why phrenico to the flexure of colon so colic it is not in any way related to the spleen but it actually supports the spleen from below this phrenico colic ligament that is why it is called as the sustentaculum lineae sustentaculum lineae phrenico colic ligament next uh, what you see is the posterior or medial end it is somewhat blunt and rounded it is not a sharp or pointed end it is a blunt and rounded <coughs> it is directed backwards and medially this is downwards forwards and laterally the anterior or lateral end so here you see the posterior or medial end directed backwards and medial so corresponds are present opposite the 10th thoracic spine two inches to the left of mid dorsal line so you are able to see the medial end and the lateral end medial end is also called as the posterior end lateral end is actually called as the anterior end it is more like a border coming to the borders of the spleen now before that i would also like to tell one thing that the anterior or lateral end is also called as the clinical angle of the spleen we we'll come to it later the borders are the superior border and the inferior border how do you identify the superior border by the presence of notches so you see some notches on the superior border okay so it is thin convex nearer to the lateral end and separates the visceral surface from the diaphragmatic surface now this notches is developmental in nature it is due to the fusion of splenoculi okay mesodermal condensations these mesodermal condensations they fuse but 
I have also seen notches even on the inferior border occasionally. Okay, so that means mainly how you identify you place the spleen in such a way the hilum is actually to the median placing inwards. The colic impression is anterior. The colic impression is anterior and anterior or lateral end is broad whereas the posterior end is somewhat pointed. So that will give a fairer idea of holding the spleen in anatomical position. Luckily there is no side determination for the spleen because there is only one spleen. It is unilateral. No confusion about whether it is right side or left side. Only thing you should hold it properly so that you don't hold the inferior border downwards and sorry superior border downwards and inferior border upwards. So two borders, superior border mainly you see it is notched and separates the visceral surface from the diaphragmatic surface. Especially it separates the gastric area, very deep impression on the visceral surface you see. Inferior border is not thin or sharp, rounded, corresponds to the 11th rib because middle 10th above 9th. And again this also separates your visceral surface from the diaphragmatic surface. And again you have the renal impression. Actually telling you should tell it separates the renal impression from the diaphragmatic surface. That is about the inferior border of the spleen. Superior border is notched. The intermediate border hilum corresponding actually to the hilum where the splenic vessels enter splenic artery, enter splenic vein leaves. Then we have lymphatic nerves are all passing through the hilum. This border separates the gastric area and the renal area of the visceral surface. The two visceral impressions, the gastric and the renal impression are actually separated by the intermediate border or the hilum of the spleen. Okay. So superior border, inferior border and intermediate border which is the hilum of the spleen. Coming to the surfaces, you see diaphragmatic surface, first surface, outer surface, convex and smooth diaphragmatic surface. It is related to the under surface of the diaphragm but separated by a recess of greater sac, peritoneum. The peritoneum is actually lining deep to the diaphragm and there is a recess of greater sac, a small recess which separates the direct they separates the diaphragm from the dorsal surface of the spleen. Above the diaphragm, it will be related to the costodiaphragmatic recess, left the costodiaphragmatic recess, the lower part and more above you go, left the border of the lung, lower border of the left lung. So here you are able to see, above the diaphragm you have the costodiaphragmatic recess, left the costodiaphragmatic recess and the lower border of the left lung. That is the relations of the diaphragmatic surface and more externally, more outwards you go, it is related to the 9th, 10th and the 11th rib. That is the relations of the diaphragmatic. So, it is related directly on the surface or left dome of the diaphragm. Between the diaphragm and the external surface of the spleen, what you have is a small recess of greater sac, not the lesser sac, greater sac. Then external to the diaphragm, you have the left costodiaphragmatic recess and lower border of the left lung. And more external to it, you have the 9th, 10th and the 11th rib. Visceral surface is marked by impressions of the various viscera. It is not uniform or smooth. It shows numerous depressions, irregular. And mainly four impressions you are able to see. The largest impression which you see between the superior border and the hilum is the gastric impression for the fundus of the stomach. The fundus of the stomach is related to the gastric area on the visceral surface of the spleen. The next major impression you see is the renal impression. So, impression of the left kidney, anterior surface of the left kidney. You see that impression between the hilum and the inferior border of the spleen. 
gastric impression, renal impression, then you have the colic impression. In front of the lateral end colic impression which is roughly triangular, this impression only makes the spleen tetrahedral in shape. It is related to the left colic flexure where the transverse colon continues as the descending colon that is called as the left colic flexure. Same way, right colic flexure also called as the hepatic flexure where the ascending colon continues as the transverse colon is called as the hepatic flexure. This is colic flexure where the transverse colon continues as the descending colon. Then you also have pancreatic impression for the tail of pancreas between the hilum and the colic impression what you see is the pancreatic impression where the tail of pancreas is present and that is also present inside the peritoneal fold that is the linearenal ligament okay the tail of pancreas which is related to this part of the spleen is present inside the linearenal ligament of peritoneum so that is how the pancreas makes an impression or related to the visceral surface of the spleen. So it is between the hilum and the impression for the colon, colic impression that is the left colic flexure. So I have discussed about the borders, we have discussed about the surfaces and its relations. Now coming to the angles of the spleen, anterior basal angle is where the superior border meets the anterior or lateral end that is actually called as the anterobasal angle. Okay. Anterobasal angle. The next, uh, this angle is the most forward projecting part. Anterior most part you can tell this part, the anterobasal angle. And it is this part which is palpated below the left costal margin during splenectomy and that is why it is actually called as the clinical angle of the spleen. The anterobasal angle is called as the clinical angle because it is the most projecting part and this part can be palpated first below the left costal margin in splenobegaly and to palpate this the spleen would have enlarged three to four times more than the original position. That its original position it should have enlarged three or four times. So that is the anterobasal angle, which is also called as the clinical angle of the spleen. Next, you see the posterior basal angle, which is actually the junction of the inferior border and the lateral end of the spleen. Inferior border, lateral end of the spleen. That junction is actually called as the posterior or posterior basal angle. So here you are able to see the anterior basal angle which enlarges can be palpated immediately that is actually called as the clinical angle of the spleen. Coming to the peritoneal relations or the peritoneal coverings of the spleen, spleen is very much an intraperitoneal organ. It is covered by peritoneum on all sides by the greater sac except near the hilum it is covered by the peritoneum of the lesser sac first ligament is the gastrosplenic ligament so the gastrosplenic ligament which encloses the gastrosplenic ligament which encloses sorry which connects the fundus to the hilum ventral lip of the hilum okay from the fundus of stomach to the ventral lip of the hilum is the gastrosplenic ligament it transmits short gastric arteries to the fundus of the stomach the next ligament what you see here is the linearenal ligament linearenal ligament extending from the spleen to the kidney and that is the suprarenal you are able to see linearenal ligament so from the hilum so the anterior surface of left kidney is actually called as the linear. Linear means again other name for the spleen, linear renal. Some books mention it as splenorenal also. That transmits your splenic vessels and tail of pancreas 
and some lymph nodes. Pancreaticosplenic lymph nodes are also present in the linearenal ligament extending from the hilum of the spleen to the left kidney. Then you also have a ligament which is called as lineophrenic ligament. Upward extent of this lineal ligament to the diaphragm. Okay, from the lineal ligament, upward extension to the diaphragm is actually called as the lineophrenic ligament, and it suspends the spleen from above, and that is why it is also called as the suspensory ligament of spleen. Whereas the other ligament which we have already seen, phrenicocolic ligament, you are able to see here from the left flexor of colon to diaphragm. It immediately passes behind the lateral end of the spleen or anterior or lateral end of the spleen. This is actually called the sustentaculum linei. That is the phrenicocolic ligament because it suspends the spleen from below. The other one is actually the lineophrenic ligament, which is called as the suspensory ligament of spleen. So here you are able to see the spleen visceral surface. The fundus of stomach making an impression on the visceral surface, renal impression, which is made by the anterior surface of the left kidney. From the fundus to the ventral lip of the hilum is the gastrosplenic ligament. Then from the fundus, sorry, from the hilum to the kidney is actually the lineo-renal or spleno-renal ligament. This transmits short gastric artery, this transmits splenic vessels, and then tail of pancreas. Okay. So that is about the peritoneal coverings. Little more about the peritoneal coverings we will see after a few slides in the development. So mainly it is supplied by the splenic artery which is a largest branch of the celiac trunk. We are able to see the celiac trunk is short stop. From this the largest artery or the branch is the celiac from the celiac tract is the splenic artery which is tortuous in course seen along the upper border of the pancreas. Posterior superior border of the body of the pancreas enters the lineal ligament. The hilum it divides into five or more segmental branches. Okay, enters the lineal ligament and the hilum divides into segmental branches which is five or more. And these branches are actually end arteries. So, if any of the branch is actually occluded, there is no anastomosis. So, it might lead to necrosis of the tissue. So, splenic arteries are end arteries, especially these branches. So, passes behind the stomach and the lesser sac along the posterior superior border of the pancreas. Splenic vein again it starts union of five or more veins from the hilum it emerges as a single trunk again intimately related to the splenic artery on the posterior surface of the body of pancreas then joins with the superior mesenteric vein. Splenic vein joins with the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein and this also receives splenic vein also receives the inferior pan inferior mesenteric vein. Okay, so splenic vein along with the superior mesenteric vein forms the portal vein. Apart from that, splenic vein also receives the inferior mesenteric vein, a tributary. Nerve supply, it is mainly supplied by sympathetics from the celiac plexus which is surrounding the celiac trunk. There is no parasympathetic because no secreto motor it is not going to secrete any hormones nor motility. So there is no parasympathetic component. Lymphatics mainly draining the capsule part because that itself is a lymphoid organ. So the deeper parts drain through the medulla part of the spleen cortex and from there in the medulla we have the medullary sinusoids. Okay. So mainly the outer part, the capsule part all drains into the pancreaticosplenic lymph nodes, then the trabeculae and the peritoneal lining. So capsule, trabeculae and peritoneal lining is drained by the pancreaticosplenic lymph nodes. 
that is about the nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage. Now, we just in short, we will see about the development of spleen. Spleen is actually developed in the dorsal mesogastrium. It is called as the dorsal mesogastrium. So, the stomach is suspended from the body wall by ventral and dorsal mesogastrium. So, each mesogastrium has a double layered fold. In between these two layers, the spleen develops. It is a mesodermal condensation. Numerous, what happens? Mass of these cells called as splenunculi, they fuse to form a single spleen. Now, because the spleen is developed in the dorsal mesogastrium, the whole of the dorsal mesogastrium is divided from the stomach to the spleen is called as the gastrosplenic ligament. From the spleen to the kidney is actually called as the lineo-renal ligament. Okay, mesenchymal condensation forms splenal coli, and the point of fusion is represented as notched border. In the superior border, you see the notches, it is nothing but the fusion of this splenal coli. So, it is originally in the dorsal mesogastrium and behind the stomach, but when the rotation of the stomach takes place, naturally the spleen is actually pushed near to the lateral and there it actually present in the left hypochondria. Okay. Sometimes accessory splenic coli fail to fuse and they can seen as the accessory spleen, mainly the gastrosplenic or lineo-renal ligament. So coming to the clinical aspects of spleen, first thing is the splenomegaly, enlargement of the spleen in various infection cases like malaria or typhoid, mostly you can see it is enlarged. So, it might enlarge 3 to 4 times, then it can be felt behind the costal uh, border, beyond the costal margin, left the costal margin. Sometimes, what happens is some tumors also get confused for enlarged spleen. Now, if the spleen is enlarged, it will push the transverse colon, colic flexure more forward and then what happens, you hear a tympanic note on percussion. If you do not hear a tympanic note on percussion, that means it is not pushed forward, it is not splenomegaly, it might be due to some other tumor in the abdomen, might be kidney. Also what happens, below the costal margin sometimes it can be felt. In that case, what happens is the left colic flexure will not be pushed more anteriorly, so you do not get a tympanic percussion. Instead, you get a dull percussion. So, other causes might be due to infiltration in case of leukemia or portal vein obstruction, all these are causes for splenomegaly. So, usually it becomes palpable only when it is enlarged 3 to 4 times than its normal size. Rupture of spleen might take place. So, by direct blow or fracture of the ribs from side, external injury or blow, what happens is the rib, 9th, 10th or 11th rib, when it is fractured, it might go and puncture. So, rupture of spleen which leads to splenic hemorrhage. And the blood, when it is collected below the diaphragm, might irritate the diaphragm and that referred pain can be felt along the left shoulder that is actually called as the cares sign. Left shoulder referred pain due to the blood collected below the left donor of diaphragm following rupture of the spleen. So, surgical removal due to rupture or occlusion of the artery or in some cases I told you in certain cases of lymphoma it is advised to remove the spleen. So, that is called a splenectomy. You should be very careful to secure the tail of pancreas and then cut your lineo-renal ligament or the gastrosplenic ligament. Both are considered as the pedicles, pedicle of the spleen. Only if you cut that, then the, you can actually, spleen comes free. So, that is about the spleen. Now, we will also see about the celiac trunk. So, without knowing the celiac trunk, the blood supply to all these structures of the foregut, especially stomach, pancreas, liver, spleen, 
upper part of the duodenum is all taken care of by this. So, in the preceding classes, sorry, succeeding classes, we are going to see these organs one by one. So, before that, naturally you should know the celiac tract, only then you will be able to appreciate the blood supply of these structures. So, mainly we will discuss about the celiac trunk regarding the origin followed by its course, branches and relations. Okay. So, that is about the learning objectives. So, it is the artery of the foregut. The celiac trunk is actually considered as the artery of the foregut. So, naturally supplies all the structures derived from the foregut, right from the lower end of esophagus, stomach, duodenum. Duodenum, second part up to the major duodenal papillae where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct opens up to that, it is foregut. So, accessory organs of digestion, your liver, gallbladder, pancreas are all derived from the foregut along with the spleen. So, lower end of esophagus, stomach and duodenum up to the major duodenal papillae, then accessory glands are the liver, gallbladder, pancreas and then spleen. These are all supplied by the celiac trunk which is the artery of the foregut. Here you are able to see the celiac trunk, a very short stump 1.25 centimeters that is all which is arising from the abdominal aorta, ventral branch, first ventral branch of abdominal aorta. Where abdominal aorta is branches coming from the front, ventral branches, coming from sides, lateral branches, coming from behind, which is actually called as the posterior branches. So, it has anterior ventral branches, lateral set of branches and posterior branches. First ventral branch of abdominal aorta is the celiac trunk. At T12 or immediately between T12 and T11, once the iota enters the abdomen through the aortic opening, so it is present between the T12 and the L1 vertebra. A very short stump projecting anteriorly 1.25 centimeters and it is directed forwards and to the right, immediately divides into three branches. Okay. So, left gastric artery, common hepatic artery and splenic artery. Okay. Smallest branch is the left gastric artery, largest branch is the splenic artery of the celiac trunk. So, three branches you remember, left gastric, common hepatic and then the splenic artery. So, relations of the celiac trunk, it is present behind the lesser omentum and the lesser sac. So, you are able to see the lesser momentum and the lesser sac is the space behind that. Okay. Then, on either side it is related to the cusp of the diaphragm because it is near to the posterior abdominal wall. Right and left cusp of the diaphragm, the right and left cusp of the diaphragm, it is related to it. Then, this is sandwiched between the one part of the pancreas called as the tuber omentane, tuber omentane and above the papillary process of the liver. To that it is related. Right, right crust, left crust, then it is completely surrounded by the celiac plexus. So, predominantly a sympathetic plexus but also has parasympathetic component. That celiac plexus again can be divided right and left celiac plexus to subdivisions. Okay. So, that is it below tuber omentale, which is cut here to show the formation of splenic vein by the urine of formation of portal vein by the urine of splenic and the superior eccentric vein. So, below it is related to the tuber omentale of the pancreas surrounded by the celiac plexus. Branches, I told you three branches. One is the left gastric, other one is the common hepatic and third one is the splenic artery. Smallest branch but greatest contribution to the stomach. Left gastric artery. Once it arises, it passes forwards, upwards and to the right in the gastropancreatic fold of peritoneum. Also the 
lift the gastropancreatic food okay and supports it to lift the lift the gastropancreatic food that enters the lesser omentum between the two layers intimately related to the lesser curvature of the stomach anastomosis with the right gastric artery anastomosis with the right gastric artery between the two layers of the lesser omentum in the lesser curvature of the stomach it may also give some esophageal branches okay so it gives some esophageal branches few esophageal branches is also given by the left gastric artery smallest branch of the celiac tract next you see the common hepatic artery common hepatic artery runs towards the right and the right gastropancreatic fold between the stomach and the pancreas your right gastropancreatic fold then it will reach the first part of duodenum along the upper border of the first part of duodenum and there it will give a branch which is the right gastric artery the gastro duodenal artery so it mainly gives rise to these branches before that here it is related to the right free margin of lesser omentum to the right side it is related to the bile duct behind it is related to the portal vein so this forms also the right free margin of lesser omentum anterior margin of epiploic foramen so behind this the greater sac communicates with the lesser sac so it ascends in the right free margin of lesser omentum then near the porta hepatis of the liver it divides into right and left proper hepatic artery this is actually called as the common hepatic once the common hepatic gives rise to the right gastric and gastro duodenal it continues in the right free margin of lesser omentum as the proper hepatic and that divides into right and left proper hepatic arteries for the corresponding right and left lobe of the liver the right hepatic artery before entering the porta hepatis also gives the cystic artery which is going to supply the gall bladder it will give branches on the inferior surface and the superior surface cystic artery is the right hepatic artery okay so mainly right gastric artery and then what you have is the gastro duodenal artery we know right gastric artery in the lesser omentum monostomosis with the left gastric artery so gastro duodenal artery passes behind the first part of duodenum and it is situated in the groove in the head of the pancreas and the neck of the pancreas in the groove in the head and neck of the pancreas so beyond this after giving this branch the common hepatic is actually called as the proper hepatic artery gastro duodenal artery this gastro duodenal artery will again give two branches one is the superior pancreatic duodenal and other one is the right gastro epiploic artery okay so passes this is your gastro duodenal artery behind the first part of duodenum divides into right gastro epiploic and superior pancreatic duodenal arteries okay the gastro duodenal artery sometimes give a branch to the duodenum also called as wilkie's artery supra duodenal artery of wilkie w i l k i e supra duodenal artery so right gastroepiploic enters the two layers of the greater omentum and anastomosis with the left gastroepiploic artery which is from the splenic artery okay that is the right gastroepiploic divides into the gastro duodenal artery divides into right gastro epiploic other one is the superior pancreatic duodenal artery that is see the groove between the concavity of the duodenum at the head of the pancreas it will form an arterial arcade by anastomosing with the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery which is a branch from superior mesenteric artery so i will repeat 
gastro duodenal artery gives rise to two branches one is the right gastro epiploic and other one is the superior pancreatic duodenum right gastro epiploic anastomosis the left gastro epiploic from spleen superior pancreatic duodenal anastomosis the inferior pancreatic duodenum superior descent superior pancreatic and inferior pancreatic duodenum responsible for supplying the head of the pancreas and also the adjoining part of the duodenum so here you are able to see the gastro duodenal artery dividing into what you call that is the superior pancreatic duodenum and what more will be the one more thing will be the right gastro epiploic artery next is the splenic artery you are able to see that is actually the splenic artery tortuous in nature present behind the lesser omentum and the lesser sac related to the superior border of the body of the pancreas it is an end artery and largest branch of the celiac trunk these spinal branches are actually end arteries because before that it gives some other branches runs along the upper border of the pancreas as i told you in front of the left kidney and suprarenal and enters the lineal renal ligament along with the tail of the pancreas and reaches the hilum of the spleen where it divides into five or more segmental branches the branches of splenic artery are mainly it gives along its course from the trunk pancreatic branches it gives pancreatic branches which supply the pancreas one of the branch is large and it is called as the arteria pancreatica magna one of the pancreatic branch is large and called as the great or the arteria pancreatica magna then short gastric branches to the fundus of the stomach it gives short gastric branches to the fundus of the stomach this is a short gastric branches then left the gastro epiploic artery along the greater curvature within the two layers of the greater omentum anastomosis with the right gastro epiploic artery these are the major branches of the splenic artery pancreatic branches short gastric branches and left gastro epiploic artery okay so a short recap of the branches what we have seen celiac tract has got left gastric common hepatic splenic left gastric gives esophageal branches and gastric branches along the lesser curvature common hepatic gives right gastric artery gastro duodenal beyond that it is called as proper hepatic which divides into right and left proper hepatic gastro duodenal again gives rise to superior pancreatic duodenal and right gastro epiploic artery one more thing right proper hepatic will give cystic artery splenic artery will give rise to short gastric branches pancreatic branches and left gastro epiploic artery so that is all for today thank you very much for your patient listening